Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another Kavli Conversation on science communication. My name's Dan Fagan. I'm a professor of journalism here at the Carter Institute of Journalism at NYU. And it's an honor and a pleasure to welcome Elizabeth Colbert, whoops, Elizabeth Colbert, uh, and uh, Dr. Stuart Pym, two people whose work in science and in journalism I've admired for, well, t more than 25 years now. And uh, we're thrilled to have them with us. We're also thrilled to have our online audience. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we do have a microphone set up here on the side for live questions, so please feel free to take advantage of that. Uh, and those of you who are watching online, feel free to send questions along for Betsy or Stuart using the hashtag Cavley Convo. But really, the person who should be explaining all that is our moderator and distinguished writer in residence here at the Carter Institute, and that is Robert Lee Holtz, a science writer at the Wall Street Journal. Lee, uh, we appreciate your amazing, the amazing job you do hosting these conversations, and here you are with another one, so take it away. Thank you, Professor Fagan. So, welcome to the Cavalier Conversations on Science Communication. Uh, these conversations are sponsored by the Cavalier Foundation and the NYU Science Health Environmental Reporting Program under the leadership of, uh, if I may say, our distinguished water boy. Um, <laughs> Uh, Dan Fagan, and um, this is the third in our fall series. Uh, and our idea here is to bring together a leading researcher and an esteemed science journalist to explore how they best bring the general public into the world of new research and the community of discovery. Just looking forward for a second, on November 10th, uh, we will be going to the dogs. We'll be hosting Barnard College psychologist and author Alexandra Horowitz, whose new book, Being a Dog, uh, uh, is out this month. And uh, with her will be science journalist Virginia Morell, who is uh, author of the New York Times bestseller, Animal Wise. And then we'll conclude our fall conversations on December 1st with uh, NYU social media scholar and author Dana Boyd, and I'm pleased to say Wall Street Journal technology columnist Christopher Mim. And they will be discussing cyber shaming shunning, uh, quirky behavior, and all the other things we've come to learn to love about social media. Now, as we go, I want to encourage you all in our audience here to offer your questions. This is not a lecture. This is indeed a conversation. And uh, remember, though, to use the microphone. We want the world to hear what you're asking us so they'll understand our answers. And those of you who are watching online, you can tweet your questions to us using the hashtag Cavley Convo. Now, this is a series about public communication. And tonight, we're going to be exploring the relationship between what um, one of our esteemed guests this evening nicely called what we know and what we refuse to know. Indeed, on the eve of a general election in this presidential year of stump speeches and position papers and debates, we have heard surprisingly little from any candidate in any primary season or general uh, uh, election run about our topic for this evening, the fate of the Earth <coughs> in a time of climate change and the accelerating extinction of species. We have to help us uh, talk about this topic to influential and, may I say, prophetic <coughs> voices. S Dr. Stuart Pym is one of the world's premier conservation biologists the Doris Duke Chair of in Conservation Ecology in the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University. And we're very pleased that he's flown up here tonight to be with us. He is a world leader in the study of present day extinctions and what can be done to prevent them. Uh, he has published more than 250 scientific peer reviewed articles as well as several books. He also contributes to the National Geographic blog. He's worked and taught in Africa for nearly 20 years on elephants, and mostly, most recently lions, through the National Geographic Big Cats Initiative. But uh, his focus is always on the topics that relate to the conservation of wildlife and the ecosystems on which they depend. And then here to my immediate left, we are graced with Elizabeth Colbert, who's been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 1999, 
and it's hard for me to think of an award she hasn't won. National Magazine Award for Public Interest, the American Association for the Advancement of Science Journalism Award, and the 2006 National Academy Communication Award. Uh, she's author of uh, Field Notes from a Catastrophe, Man, Nature, and Climate Change, which the Los Angeles Times uh, called a small miracle of concision, gaining by its brevity and its plan of attack a rhetorical power that elucidates, rises to meet, and deftly answers the historic crisis in which we find ourselves. And her latest book is The Sixth Extinction, an Unnatural History, which uh, she won for which she won the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. And in making that award, the Pulitzer Board said in its citation uh, that this book is an exploration of nature that forces readers to consider the threat posed by human behavior in a world of astonishing diversity. And I may say, uh, no slouch, just this past week, the New Yorker published her most recent major piece on the loss of the Greenland ice sheet, A Song of Ice in which she considers just what happens when a country starts to melt. Now, normally I would ramp up and ask you some questions about what you were doing in grade school and you know, what uh, was your first pet and how did this get you interested in wildlife biology, but really I'd really like to start off this evening by talking about silence. We have this past season observed a remarkable absence of discussion on what clearly are topics of, of global consequence. And I wonder if I could ask your opinion as to why. And Dr. Pym, let me start with you. I should say by way of full disclosure that I am a card-carrying member of a group called Science Debate. I probably have a membership number in the single digits. I was there at the beginning when it was founded <laughs> by, amongst other people, Cheryl Kirstenbaum, who was in my lab at the time. Um, science debate tries to engage politicians um, to address scientific questions. Um, and we have got to the stage where we send um, the leading candidates questions and they answer them, um, um, sometimes answer them, um, by, uh, by sending written responses back. Um, that's better than nothing. Is it, um, is it as good as having them uh, you know, discuss things in, in the debates? Clearly not. Um, but there is a moment among scientists to, to, to hold politicians' feet to the fire on, on scientific issues and make sure that they at least have some statement about what they are going to do if and when they come to office. Um, yes, they ought to be more, uh, the progress is glacial um, and incremental, but, but I think there is, th there is movement here. No, oh, well, okay, so uh, Betsy, if I may. Um, do you agree? Uh, it seems to me that both of you uh, are just a few of the, of the voices uh, that in the, in the world of journalism and in the world of uh, the research uh, community who have passionately advocated for these causes for now decades. Um, and that seems to little effect. And I don't mean to start off on such a <laughs> challenging note, Thanks, but, but that's you. the point. So, so what's the problem here? It's not your prose style. Well, I, I mean, I, I want to say that, you know, the campaign actually began, you could argue, uh, on a, with, with a fair amount of, of discussion, and you have to actually credit Bernie Sanders um, for that. There, w there was actually a fair amount of, of discussion about climate change, and then when we entered this really you know, dismal general election, I would say really anything that counts as an issue almost has dropped out. But, but I do think a question that is worth asking in a, in a you know, journalism school is you know, where, where were the questions at the debate? I, every mm. debate there was like a drumbeat of, okay, is tonight, is there gonna be a question about climate change um, and climate change policy? And there never was. And I was obviously, no one asked, I was not privy to the conversations that went into drawing up those lists of questions, but I would like to know why there, why there never was one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think part um, of the problem is, is that um, an awful lot of what um, is covered by um, stories of the environment 
um, is unrelentingly depressing. You know, it's bad, 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 bad. You watch um, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth. You watch Leonardo DiCaprio's The 11th Hour. It's an unrelenting story of gloom and doom. Um, and I think the problem is that we are not talking about solutions. People often ask me, you know, how do you get up in the morning? You know, when Al Gore says species are going extinct a thousand times faster than they should be, he's quoting me. So, you know, how, well, you know, how, do, you, how do you get up in the morning? Sure, you can't object to that. No, I get up in the morning because I focus on solutions. Um, and I think the problem is that um, there isn't, and this is a failure for all of you future journalists, um, so shame. Um, <laughs> There is, there potential, is shame. Sh potential shame. Potential <laughs> shame. Yeah. Withheld shame. Um, there is a problem is we don't talk about what can happen. And if there's, no, if there's no optimism, if there's no alternatives, then politicians aren't going to engage. Politicians are policy makers. So what are the policy solutions that matter? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we've done a poor job of, of stressing the fact that there are policy solutions um, and we need to be talking about them because that's what politicians understand. So, but, Betsy, do you sort of believe this is just a literature of despair? Well, I, I mean, I think that, you know, just to, to talk about the election, we, we have, you know, two candidates who in, you know, you know Hillary Clinton has a, a climate change um, solutions, you know, agenda. You can, you can debate whether, you know, what's in it. It's, it's very vague. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details right now, but, or the lack of details right now, but, you know, but it exists. And she did spend a day with Al Gore down in Florida, and that was sort of the high point of, you know, for climate change um, in this campaign, in the general election campaign. Um, you know, the Republican platform and Donald Trump have really, you know, pretty much nothing um, on, on combating climate change, let's say. And, um, you know, that could be, that could have been a s something where you would make sort of a stark contrast. And one of the interesting things that's actually come out in some of the WikiLeaks um, emails is some of the back and behind the scenes conversations in the Clinton uh, campaign mm -hmm. about s stances mm -hmm. that they wanted to take on issues relating to climate change and, you know, mm -hmm. where the polling was and mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't mean to sort of pin the, the silence or the absence of uh, conversation on candidates because surely at, in some very fundamental way, what candidates talk about sure is just simply a, a, a measure of what we in the general population are concerned about and what we're talking about. So um, I asked it from that standpoint. So let me, let me rephrase the question and say, when you reach out, sir, who is your audience? Um, I spend a fair bit of time on Capitol Hill. Uh, I'm I, I don't like the word advocate um, because that suggests that I'm arguing one side or the other for the sake of arguing. But I'm very much an activist scientist. Uh, I'm on Capitol Hill. I've testified to committees many times. I, I want uh, political leaders to, to engage on, on environmental issues, including global climate change, including the loss of biodiversity. Um, you've got to make it, you've got to connect with what matters to them. I mean, if you've ever spent any time in Congress walking the corridors of power, what our elected officials do is not sit in the debating chamber debating. They sit in their office where little groups of people come in um, throughout the day and ask for pieces of legislation uh, that will personally enrich them. And you see these little groups of people, um, that they're all carrying their, their overnight bags so that they look as if they're from the district. <laughs> Apart from one person who is wearing the best suit, who mm -hmm. is the lobbyist. Um, and they're saying, what, you know, Congressman, Senator, what can you do for me? So I think what we have to do is we have to learn to engage politicians and talk about what, um, what it's going to do to them. Mm -hmm. um, what is it going to do to, to a politician mm -hmm. who, who lives in Florida where mm -hmm. sea level rise and increasing mm -hmm. flooding is making a difference? Um, what does it mean to a politician who lives next to a national park? Mm 
like the Great Smoky now Mountains National Park, which gets 10 million visitors a year. Um, I think there are connections there where you can tell elected officials that the environment matters to them, um, and you have to frame it in those kind of, those kind of terms. So, Betsy, to, to kind of take this off um, Capitol Hill and, and into the realm of people that we might consider readers or viewers or listeners, who's your audience? Well, I mean, I consider my audience to be, you know, potentially, and this is a modest claim, I know, you know, everyone. I mean, I, I, I am hoping to reach uh, everyone from high school students to... You know, when I worked at the Times for many years, and you know, we we did. It's sort of a myth, but it's sort of true that we we wrote, you know, for for an eighth grade audience. You know, everyone should be able to to read it, and and that is still how I sort of look at things. I mean, almost anyone should be able to pick up something that I write and and, and get through it, and that's my hope. Now, is that you know really going to happen? You know, no. But but I do h hope that that my audience potentially contains any any semi-interested person, and, and hopefully even people who don't think they're interested, uh, but happen to pick it up. You know, is that realistic? You know, probably not. So no, I'm curious if I may ask, you had a, a, a very good career going uh, early on at the New York Times. You were uh, very interested in political reporting. Um, why, did, why did you change gears and switch to science and environmental writing? Well, it's a, it's a sort of long, complicated story, but, but one of the reasons is that I sort of got tired of the, you know, endless four-year cycle where we repeat the same things, and I was interested in, in stories that, um, you know, we're, we're, go we're gonna last, um, and we're gonna be true next year and the year after, and unfortunately, s stories about climate change and the environment are gonna be, you know, true forever for the lifetimes of, you know, everyone. Uh, in this room, um, they will never go out of date like you know yesterday's Hillary Clinton story. Um, but I did cover politics for a long time in Albany, especially. And I think one of the problems I was listening to Stuart, and you know, a lot of things flooded back to me of sitting in the halls in Albany waiting for people to come out of meetings. Um, and you know, one of the obvious problems that we have in environmental issues is the constituency unless it's a you know, drinking water problem or, or something like that where people are being poisoned, you know, if the constituency is, a, is another species, uh, that species doesn't vote. And that's a very, very obvious you know, problem that we have, um, that, 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 that animals don't vote. If they did, you know, we'd have a very different legislature. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm much more optimistic than that. I mean, I, I, I go head to head with some really nasty people. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, and, and the one thing that gives me enormous encouragement is I own their children. <laughs> um, you own their that's, children. That's, that's you guys, right? Um, I mean, you know, your father may be the president of the napalm manufacturers of America, uh, but you're here um, listening to us. Uh, and, and so my students at Duke, uh, whoever their fathers and mothers may be, um, are in my class because they care about the future. Um, and so I do think that, you know, I, I'm a very optimistic person in that, that, I, that, that I think we can sell a concern about, about the future of our planet. Sell and we can do it to people just like you. So, so, you, so you see yourself not just as a researcher, not just as a, a conservation biologist, but also as a salesperson. Well, I, I who, no, no, I that, mean, that's that sounds a, a little thing. bit. Who, but <laughs> what I'm curious is, who is what do you see as your as your product? Um, it's, in this instance, it, it's to inspire people to care about about Earth, and I think young people are inspired. I think people are young people are concerned about what's going around, um, and, and and so I want to. I want to enhance that commitment. I want to get them excited. I want to, to tell them there is hope, that there is things that they can do. Um, and, um, I, and I think that's a very powerful way forward. Do you agree? <laughs> no. That Stuart should inspire people. With yes, the, I no, with, <laughs> with, with, the, uh, with, with, with the sale, with the salesmanship of hope. Well, I, I see my, you know, I see my role 
differently. Uh -huh. I, I, I'm a journalist, and I, you know, see my role as simply sort of putting out information, and I actually don't see see myself as as, as an advocate um, for any. Even you could argue. I mean, is the cause um, you you should care? I suppose that's implicit. You know, you don't journalists don't write about things that they think no one should care about. That's sort of a given, I suppose. Um, but beyond that, um, I don't know that I see. I don't. I don't say at the. I don't feel like at the end you should emerge from something that I've written with hope or without hope. What you do with that is sort of your your call. And I think you know that's. That's what we journalists often, you know, you could argue that's a dodge. It's a bit of a dodge, but I, I actually genuinely feel that way. So uh, you're neutral on the topic of extinction? No, I'm neutral on the topic of hope. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Now, is that, is that uh, I, I know that, I know that uh, uh, that's a, a, a plausible journalistic position, um, but uh, I am uh, curious to, to probe that a little bit because one of the things that of course characterizes environment writing kind of as a general thing is that it's a uh, the town crier of, uh, of uh, problems that need to be solved yeah. so it's, so so you're not sort of neutral because you're picking out a particular topic to devote your considerable skills and, and talents to call it in, the, in the cause of calling attention to that this is something that you ought to be worried about I'm not going to tell you what to do uh, Stuart will tell you what to do, but exactly. I'm going to set it. I'm going to set the stage for him. So you're not really as neutral as you say. No, I, I, I don't. I, obviously, if I have I, no. I don't want to say that I'm, I'm neutral in the sense that I, I don't think that this is the or one of the major issues of our time. I, 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 I do, and I hope that, I hope that that does come through in what I write. I just don't, I just don't feel prescriptive about what you should then t t do with that information. I see. I see. How's that? Well, I wonder um, if the two of you each see the sort of extinction biodiversity crisis quite the same way. I mean, in the sense of, of how, do you, how do you measure this uh, in an accurate and believable way, Stuart? Um, part of what I do is to, you know, to do the stuff that Al Gore quotes, you know, species are going extinct a thousand times faster than they should be. So I, I document where those extinctions are happening, how fast they're happening, what species are involved, all that kind of very basic um, uh, scientific documentation. But a much bigger piece of what I do is to, is to look at what the solutions are. I do that. Mm -hmm. I do all of my science because I want my science to be actionable. To be actionable. Actionable. I'm not somebody who sits in his or her ivory tower. Mm -hmm. I despise that. I think a scientist has a, a role to, to society um, to, to look at what's going on and to provide the information that allows society to, to take actions to, to change things. So most of what I do is looking for, you know, is looking for solutions, looking for ways of preventing human wildlife conflict in Africa. You know, lions can't just live in national parks. They stray outside of national parks. They kill people's livestock. How can we prevent that? How can we stop species going extinct in, in Brazil or Colombia or Madagascar? So I'm looking for, for very, um, uh, very clever, um, you know, innovative ways to, to prevent species from taking place. And I am a complete pro proponent for hope. I have to say mm -hmm. that I was not entirely kind in my review of Betsy's book. Um, <laughs> because yeah, you beat her up. I yeah. beat her up. <laughs> and, and it isn't because she is a, you know, she's a fabulous essayist. Mm -hmm. But I sort of felt, you know, that if, you know, if I was your doctor instead of your conservation biologist, and you came to me, you came to me, and I say, said, you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to be really horrible. And it's going to be, mm -hmm. there's no, you know, it's unavoidable. It's going to be really terrible. You wouldn't come back. <laughs> um, what we do with medicine is I say, 
you know, if you, you know, if you exercise and you eat right and you don't smoke and you do all the right things, I'll help you live a longer and better life. And that's what I do with species. I, I, I'm looking for ways of making species live as long as they possibly can. Um, so I, I, I love the adventure of your book. I mean, these are my friends that you're writing about, right? Um, but I wanted that other chapter. I wanted that last chapter that, you know, what is, I, Pandora's box, the last things that comes out of Pandora's box is hope. Um, so next time, hope, <laughs> please, hope. Okay, next book. Well, you know, you, 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 you raise an interesting and, and telling point, which is, uh, uh, you know, I guess it was the, uh, the old Tammany Hall uh, cry, so what are you going to do about it? Um, but sort of that's your problem, is it not? Mm. Uh, not Betsy's problem. Um, oh, no, shame. <laughs> I mean, no, no, come on. You're journalists. I mean, all these wonderful young people are going to be you know, here because they want to write about our world. Why, why separate out the hope bit? Well, I'm not suggesting, and I, and I shouldn't take words out of your mouth, I don't think that she's suggesting that there's no place for hope, but that rather, as a journalist, you're supposed to sort of see things perhaps as they are, not as they might be. Oh, I'm not. That's your position I'm as not, an advocate. No, I'm not an advocate. Oh, um, you sound like an advocate no, to me. No, I'm an activist. You're opposing retail solutions to a wholesale, a wholesale problem. I'm... I'm, I'm I'm definitely coming up with solutions. Yes. Um, I'm definitely looking at the science and trying mm -hmm. to get the science right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm doing that because I want it to, it's like somebody, a doctor who studies disease. You know, if you know that there's this little thing that goes and it's carrying malaria, then you, you, you know, you have a mosquito net and you mm -hmm. make sure you don't get bitten. Um, that's part of that working out the basic science and working out mm -hmm. a solution. And I think you have to have that complete package because to, to stop short of that, I think you're missing the whole story. What do you think of that? Well, I, I think, look, I mean, uh, inver environmental writing always, you know, usually has or often has a certain structure and um, everyone in this room, you know, is familiar with it. It's, it's a structure um, most, you know, beautifully and successfully, I should add, um, laid out in Silent Spring, where you lay mm. out a really, really big problem, a terrible problem, and then at the end, uh, you, you, you lay out a solution. Yeah. Now, I think that um, what I, the, the f and I wrestled with this a lot, I, I, I really don't want to be flippant at, at, at all mm -hmm. about it, I, 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 because the obvious, um, Payoff for having written, uh, you know, read a book. If you if you're generous enough to read a book about an environmental problem, is that someone is going to? That is basically almost the assumption at the end that the, someone is going to give you the solutions. Now, the in 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 the sixth extinction, I talk about so many big global problems that it just seemed um, impossible. I'm going to be frank to say, okay, and here is the solution. There is no one solution. There, are, these are huge global issues. And I have never, I'm going to be frank, seen anyone lay out a solution to all of these problems, which include climate change, global trade and global travel, moving species around the world, uh, deforestation, ocean acidification. I mean, we have a whole constellation of problems here, not a problem, which isn't to say there's not a lot that we could be doing a great deal better, and that Stuart is trying to do better, and that many, many people are trying to do better, but I don't see a solution here. And it seemed kind of pat to lay out all these huge global problems and then say, okay, but here is the solution, as if I have a solution. I do not have a solution. And, and then, as I say, I have not met anyone. Uh, with all due um, respect to, to, to all the many great conservation biologists who are out there uh, who has a solution uh, to this problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious now, um, we're, uh, a mixed a mixed group here. Some of us are some of us are scientists. Some of us are journalists. Some of us are uh, students who are aspiring to both. So I wonder, given the 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 uh, 
scope of these slow, gradual, but unstoppable uh, sorts of forces. Um, what kind of advice would you give us to help rally people to uh, an awareness of the problem and a desire to sacrifice to solve it? The only, I mean, I agree with Betsy that, 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 that there isn't a solution um, any more than there is a cure for cancer. There are, you know, a, a, a myriad of different individual solutions that we can try. Not all of them are effective. Don't smoke. I told you that a few minutes ago. <laughs> um, and, and so what, what I see are a whole variety of different solutions. Um, some of them work, some of them don't. You know, we're going to have successes, we're going to have failures. And the important thing is that we are, we are an amazingly creative and innovative species. We can come up with lots and lots of different ideas. And I think that's, I think that's where the story is. There are all sorts of, of sort of clever things that, 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 that people do. And that's what I think we should, we should celebrate. I mean, people worry, for example, about the fact that lions are nowhere near as abundant as, as, as they once were. You know, so when Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz says, lions and tigers, oh bears, and bears, oh my, will there be wild things out there? Wouldn't it be awful if the answer were no? But what do we do about lions? Well, through the, the, the National Geographic's Big Cats Initiative, of, what I'm, of which I'm part, we realize that lions get killed when they steal people's cattle at night. So people put their cattle in a, a thorn fence called a boma. Um, and two of the sisters, you know, come up to one end of the boma and go, roar, whereupon the cattle charge out of the other end of the boma and the other two sisters grab a cow. Um, and so you wake up in the morning and you've lost your cattle and there's a bunch of fat lions and you go and kill them. So what do you do about that? You build a chain link fence around the boma. It costs about a thousand bucks. Um, and it saves, um, on average, three or four lions for every fence you build. Low-tech, simple, effective, um, and that program has probably saved something on the order of 2,000 lions in the last five years. Now, is that a solution to saving all species going extinct? No, but it's local, it's appropriate, it's a, it's a simple technology, and it works in a lot of places. And that's what I think we can do. We can be looking for, for clever, locally appropriate solutions um, that can, can make a difference. So in your experience, Betsy, so he's saving the lions one at a time. And well, I wonder... A few, hundred, a few hundred at a time. Yeah, yeah, let yeah. Us, yeah. A few hundred at a time. Okay, I, three or four. I, I didn't want to exaggerate the the scope of the, of the work, um, but I don't want to undersell it either. Um, now, I wonder in the same vein, is there a way in your experience now through many articles and several books, is there a way to talk about um, these sorts of uh, potentially apocalyptic topics in a way that actually um, reaches people? Right. Well, I, I mean, I think that, that 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 is sort of the first step, and it's 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 some something of a of a difference between the you know positions that we start with it, which is that you know Stuart, Stuart is starting from a position of you know we care about this and we want to do do something about it, and I think that to get back to question number one about this political campaign, you know, the level of interest, simple interest and knowledge, I'm gonna I think knowledge even, um, in the in the sort of world. Um, around us um, is not necessarily that high. So, you know, you could say, well, step one is that people have to know what's going on. And in, in a sense, that is more what I see as, as my job as a, as a journalist. You know, we really have to actually know what's going on before we can uh, even have any kind of conversation about it. Now, Stuart is talking to people who are extremely knowledgeable, who are out in the field, who are on the front lines of this. Um, and the question of you know where is the va where are the vast majority of people 
as I say, I think that gets back to, to the campaign. You know, where are these issues um, that, that, that both Stuart and I, I think, feel should, should be very present to people. If you could say the species, which species would you say? <laughs> Since you asked. <laughs> I'm the, 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 um, the president of an organization called Saving Species, www.savingspecies.org. And on the back row there are three of my board members uh, who will be, be handing out brochures at the end of this event. Um, the, answer is, excuse me, the answer is quite simple, that you don't really save one species at a time. You, you save... Um, you save places that matter. And there are some key places in the world where there are large numbers of species at risk of extinction. The Caribbean, the Northern Andes, coastal Brazil, Madagascar, the Philippines. Um, and if you act there, you, you, you don't have to save one species at a time. You can save whole suites of species at a time. Um, and the, the, the simple reality is, well, let me give you some science. Is it okay for me to talk a little bit of science? <laughs> Two-thirds of all species live in tropical, moist forests, rainforests, if you like. And the greatest concentration of species that are on risk of extinction live in a subset of these rainforests that we call the biodiversity hotspots. Take coastal Brazil, I was there two weeks ago. When you fly into Rio de Janeiro, great place, I have to tell you, don't feel sorry for me, it was cold and rainy two weeks ago. Um, you see a landscape that's fragmented, there's patches of forest only that remain. Species go extinct in small habitat patches. Young lady, if you thought it was miserably difficult to find a good man in, in New York on a, on, on, on a weekend, if you lived in a small habitat patch, it would be even <laughs> harder to find a good man. <laughs> um, so what can we do? Well, we can connect those forests together by a, a good person. It's, it's a problem to, to be sexist about this. It's hard to find a, uh, it's hard to find a good partner, right? Um, if you live in a tiny habitat patch. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? We can stitch those habitat patches together by reforesting connections between them. Now, when we do that, we save golden lion tamarinds, which are just to die for, cuddly little balls of sort of orange fluff. There are some in the, uh, in the zoo here in New York. Okay. You just want to go and squeeze them. They look so cuddly. If they do, they'll rip your arm off. <laughs> um, but in doing that, we're also saving a huge number of other species as well. So it's not a, a species at a time. It's, it's a strategic approach where you, where, you, um, uh, where you set priorities. You work in landscapes that matter. And we work in the Northern Andes, in Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Brazil, Madagascar, Sumatra, are places where, where we're saving more than one species at a time. Thank you for letting me talk about science. No, it was good. That was good. And we have a question here. Yeah, Betsy, would you take that, please? You've had considerable success in uh, uh, framing narratives. What, what are your tried and trues? Well, I, I, I wish I had a good answer for that. You know, I, I don't really. I, I, think, I think a story is a story, and a story can be a lot of different things. You know, it's sort of like, you know, the Supreme Court definition of obscenity. You know, you know it when you see it, but it's very hard to say in the abstract. So I, I usually personally, you know, don't go out and say I want to write about X. Sometimes I do. I, I, sh I don't want it to be disingenuous. But more often, 
you know, it's a, it's a story that hits you, something you hear about, you know, something that you read about. Um, so, you know, do those have typologies? I mean, I do think that what, you know, what, what journalists are always trying to do is, you know, sort of fight against the predictable, right? So we are trying to fight against just, uh, an, uh, you know, and in the case of environmental reporting, it does become another, you know, another terrible, awful story that you, you know, want to slit your throat about. Um, and so what I think is useful to try to do is, is to tell a good story to um, in, introduce people to just, you know, interesting stuff that they don't know um, so that there's in a lot of interesting material along the way. The, the, the story arc may still be something really, you know, a problem that makes you want to, you know, despair, um, but you've learned something, you know, along the way. Does that have a, does that have a name? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think Betsy has been far too self-deprecating. <laughs> what I love about her essays is, is, is they're about places, they're about people. There's a wonderful narrative there. They're, they're a lot, I mean, okay, some of them are my friends, but, and there are places I care about. But there's a lovely dynamism to it. It's very real stuff. It's clear that, that, that I thought when reading Betsy's book that she starts out sort of rather timidly going into the rainforest. And at the end of it, you know, she sort of slings a hammock at Camp 41, famous place, you know, and it's just really cool about being there. And I thought that's just a great story. Now, I'm a scientist, I'm not a journalist, but I love that connection to people and places. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, and then I want to take your question, but how do you settle on a vantage point? I mean, you have yourself in your work as a character. Um, it's not quite, uh, right. you know, Bet's, Betsy's adventures in the <laughs> global zoo, but it, you do uh, use yourself as an entry point? What? Uh, well, that, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've worked for The New Yorker for a long time now, and that's a relatively common, you know, vantage point for a New Yorker writer. So I, I don't, it's not like a, it's not like a, an original or unique vantage point to take. It's sort of, I, I've almost internalized it now. It's sort of, it's sort of um, uh, a, a, a way many, many, I mean, any, any of you will know that many, many New Yorker stories have written, so that, that's, that's a, a, a big part of it. It's just not, it's, 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 it's how what I was sort of trained in, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But you don't, when you write, you're not uh, trafficking in papers and citations and... Well, you, you know, that's right. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. sure that's your backdrop, but... Uh, well, you, you, you obviously, you know, if, you're tr if you are trying to write for a very wide audience, you know that there, there's a very, very limited tolerance for, I, th I think, um, and other people might disagree, but I think there's a pretty limited tolerance, tolerance for, um, you know, cite, citing scientific papers. And often, in fact, I will say that I, you know, I read the paper and I would really like to quote it, and there's literally not a single line uh, that can be quoted in a general interest, you know, publication. It's just not written uh, in English, <laughs> or to the extent it's written in English, it's written to be a sort of anodyne and 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 bland and Latinate as possible. So they're, they're not quotable at all. It's, it's actually a, uh, an interesting tension. It would be interesting actually to get scientists and journalists together about, you know, could you write something that actually could be quoted? I think that's changing, <laughs> it's changing fast. Um, the, the, the scientists are measured by what are called impact factors, the number of times your paper is cited in by other scientists. Um, but there's a new measure called outmetric which is a, a measure of how well you're picked up by the media. If my students publish papers that don't get into the top 99% uh, of papers, I take them out and shoot them. <laughs> um, so so I, we're, we're, we're getting smart about, uh, about writing papers so that the media can is pick them up. Is that contributing to the extinction crisis? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's always a lot of students out there. I mean. I think students, with the profession, we're getting smart about making sure that we, we get our message across. I've got a major paper coming out on November 11th. Um, Mark your calendar. Um, and yeah, and I, will yeah. be, I, will be, I will be emailing you the, the embargoed proofs that's coming out in science on November 4th. We all know the rules. 
Um, you better believe we have written a press release. We've got lots of beautiful photographs. I think we're learning how to do this. But you're right. I mean, that's, that's the past. I think those of us who understand that we want our science to make a difference, those of us who are activists, know that we have to learn to speak, <laughs> speak English in, 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 in simple, uh, simple ways. Well, let's circle back yeah. to that, but I'd like to take this question. Mm -hmm. I think what I've heard a lot of people say about environmental writing is that they find it just generally too bleak and depressing because, mm -hmm. frankly, when it comes to it, we haven't seen a major victory point in the environmental struggle. Um, but I think it, in likening science writing to uh, like popular fiction, for example, nobody wants to go see a, a trilogy or a series of movies that are all completely bleak and depressing. We're, we're rooting for So, why aren't you more upbeat? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it, I mean, once again, there's, it's not that, I mean, there are a lot of great stories, and I, I do want to say that there are a lot of stories being, being written, you know, if you, if you followed, you know, this, this world, you, you will find a lot of, you know, inspiring stories. I, I come, I have a certain, you know, threshold, once again, this is a sort of a, you know, when I write a story that's got to carry a, a certain number of words, it probably can't be um, a story of, you know, it has to have a certain I idea content to it, too, in a way. So, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to sort of go into the whole, you know, process of getting a story approved by, you know, a, a bank of editors. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, even, even, Victories that are inspiring and that are, you know, are very good thousand-word stories. Let's say, or two thousand-word stories. They're, they're not necessarily great, you know, eight thousand-word stories. Um, and these are just, you know, journalistic um, constraints. Um, and I don't want to. So, so, you know, I'd be happy to write about about something, but it would have to have a certain. It has to have certain components in it. I, I did write a, a, a piece recently about um, people, you know, trying to design corals that were going to uh, withstand, uh, you know, um, mm. climate change, for example. Now, that pushed things a little bit in a new direction because it was, um, you know, it was sort of a little bit of a new idea, you know, um, and whether it's going to work or not, we don't know. But, but it's just, in, in, in some sense, it's just part of it is just the demands of, of a certain length magazine story has that, which is, you know, Unfortunately, they're pretty high. The demands are pretty yeah. high. But, but if I may also say, yeah. and then we have some more questions, this also goes straight to the difference, to the tension between um, what you do as a journalist and what you, sir, do as a, as a uh, uh, scholar activist, which is, um, you know, the good news doesn't hide. Um, there are lots of ways uh, and lots of channels by which um, uh, the, the, the successes of the world get out. Some of those channels are called advertising. Some of them are in the press release that you're writing about your paper next week. And those things that are left over, those things that are under the rocks, is Betsy's world. So, I, I, you know, the well, stories well, are there. I want you to disagree? Tell you about, I want to tell you about the greatest day I had in New York. All right. I, I was a professor at Columbia for several years. And one day I was coming into my office in Shemahorn. Um, and a pigeon, a bloody pigeon wing, sort of wafted down from the sky. It was like that scene in Jurassic Park where the goat leg comes <laughs> flopping down. And I looked up and there was a peregrine falcon that was ripping apart a pigeon. Um, the reality is that peregrine falcons 40 years ago were extinct in Eastern North America. We brought them back. It's one of the great success stories, you know. And, and you should look up because with a little bit of luck, you'll see a peregrine falcon ripping open a pigeon. <laughs> I thought, what a great success story. Here in the middle of New York, great place for watching birds. Um, 
and I think all too often people, you guys, you journalists people, wallow in the, um, in, in the depressing stuff. I mean, three years ago, uh, four years ago, um, so, I was at a film festival in, in Colorado, and I was on a panel with Louis Saihoyos, who had just won an Oscar for The Code. Um, and we were having dinner together with two or three of his acolytes. Um, and we got talking, and he said, um, um, I want you to be in my next movie. And I said, no. <laughs> and I recall that two of these young ladies fell off their chairs in a swoon that I had you know, denied an Oscar-winning director. And I said, I don't want to be in another, pardon my language, I don't want to be in another bloody movie that's depressing. So I said, well, the next movie will be about solutions. And to some extent, Racing Extinction is about solutions. I think the, story, the, the stories are out there. You've got to look for them. Um, and it's, uh, it's, you've got to get past all the stuff that Betsy explains wonderfully well about what's going wrong. But there are great stories about what's doing well. So the next time you say, see a pigeon being dismembered, I want you to view that as being a measure of success. <laughs> Professor Fagan. So I, I would like to uh, speak up as a, as a charter member of the Wallow in the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> I, I think my own ratio of, of positive to negative stories, if they can be characterized that way, my career is probably a solid 15 to 1. Uh, and I, I guess I would, I would raise a couple of points that would be interesting to ha hear you all, you both respond to. And, and the first is that, you know, we're in the reality business. And if we're writing about something that's sad, then it's going to be a, a sad story. Uh, but the, the second and sort of more important point is, in my experience, people just want a good story. And it's really not so important to them whether it's hmm. quote unquote positive or negative. They want it to be interesting and real and engaging and accurate hmm. and all those things that we, we try to do and, and we, we try to teach, that I, I try to teach. <coughs> and honestly, in, in, in my experience, I, I've, I've gotten great <laughs> audience response from negative stories and, and something often very weak audience responses from positive stories. The distinction is that the people we write about, they would really prefer that we write positive stories because they feel good about what they're doing and they, they feel they're making a difference and they, and they want to continue to feel that way and they want other people to feel like what they're doing. So I guess my question is that, you know, for, for Betsy and, and Stuart both, if, if you're writing about a problem uh, and it doesn't inspire people to action, you know, what what have you accomplished? I feel like I've accomplished a lot every time I do that. Uh, but I'm not sure that Stuart agrees. And I guess I'd, I'd be curious to hear you both respond to that. How would you phrase that as a question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm not giving you a question. Well, Alex. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like I said, when Al Gore talks about species going extinct a thousand times, he's quoting me. So I, I am a purveyor of, of gloom and doom. You, know, you need to know all sorts of bad things about the environment. You can, you know, you can find my uh, uh, email and phone number on the web. Um, so uh, it, it's not that I don't, it's not that I want to suppress the, the, the bad news. Um, but I just feel that sometimes people don't go beyond that. Um, that they, they leave people with this um, sort of, I want to throw myself off a tall building attitude. Um, and, and that I think uh, is, uh, I think that's fundamentally dishonest. I, I think you, you, Dishonest? You, dishonest in the sense that it's not a complete story. Um, it's, there are bad things happening but, but people are doing something about that. And I think that's incomplete. 
I, I, dishonest is perhaps too strong a word, but it's dishonest in the sense of it's not really what's going on. It's like saying, you know, people are dying of, of heart disease. And, and that's a terrible story. It's what, the number one killer of, of, you know, of American men. Mm -hmm. but, but there's an awful lot of things you can do sure. about that. So let me interrupt you, way, sir. They eat better, you know, exercise, all the rest sir, of it. Sir, I respect what you're saying, but by your own terms. And then I want to hear what Betsy has to say about this. You are the one who has given us you know, Ooh, the yeah. formula and the equation to say tens of thousands of species are dying um, you know, every 45 minutes. And I appreciate that you're uplifted and pleased that you've managed to save two. And that's great. And your job as an activist uh, uh, advocate uh, is to call attention to that fact. But surely there's a role there for hmm. someone to call attention the other 9,998 that you haven't been able to get around to. Well, but let me put, go back to that analogy I was using. Supposing you do a story on, on, on how many hundreds of thousands of men die of heart disease every year. Okay. No, let's keep it um, to species. But, let's, but, let's but it would, to you, species. Would, you, would you then stop with that and not say there are these solutions? So yes, I'm the person that tells you how fast species are going. But the complete story is how we are slowing that rate down. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I worry about, about, I mean, this is something you probably all consider in journalism. Where does the story end? And, and I, I mean, take Al Gore's um, An Inconvenient Truth. It's unrelentingly depressing um, when, in fact, there are, there are solutions out there. And I felt that, that the, what was wrong with that was that, that it was inappropriate to, to end where it did without sort of saying, you know, there are renewables and there's efficiencies and there's a whole bunch of other things. I just struck me, I mean, perhaps this is my scientist in me talking no. about it. It's, an incom it's incomplete science if you don't present the whole story. Hmm. Betsy, you answered Dan's question. Well, I, What's the I, value you of you a know, negative story? I, obviously, I... I I, I do what I do, how's that? And you can, you know, once again, you can, you, you, I, I let my readers decide and that is, you know, they can choose to, to, to not read it for among other things. And that's probably, the, to be honest, the very most common response to these stories. But I think that the health analogy is, is also an incomplete analogy. Mm. I mean, we, we cover the war in Syria. We don't say, oh, there's really good news here. Why isn't someone finding, you know, there are a couple kids who are saved in Syria, you know, let's, let's celebrate that. We say, this is terrible, <laughs> you know, and you, you do what you will with that information. And hopefully, you can say, hopefully, uh, your response is going to be, you know, we really ought to have, uh, a, you know, some, some solution here. Someone ought to find a solution here, but we don't, uh, expect that stories that have a tragic nature, and I, I want to say I, I'm, I, I, f I feel weird to be honest, arguing against your, uh, whose you know seminal papers on this subject are the basis uh, for so much uh, of, of of what people are writing and thinking about these days. Uh, but this is tragic. This is a tragic situation for many species on Earth. I will tell you a story. Uh, you might have read about it in an op-ed that ran um, in the New York Times a c uh, just a week or two ago. Uh, about a species that went extinct just last week. Um, it was a species of um, tree frog, the rabs fringe limb tree frog. Uh, it was just discovered about 10 or 15 years ago in the uh, forests of Panama as uh, the chytrid fungus was, was sweeping through. Mm. Uh, three of them uh, were taken into captivity, one in Panama that I met, as it were, uh, when I was down in Panama, uh, two to the Atlanta Botanical Garden, the two at the Atlanta Botanical Garden both unfortunately turned out to be male. Uh, so mm. they are, never produced any offspring. One of them held on for a remarkably long time. It was at least 11 uh, when he died. It was a really interesting species. They laid their eggs in these little b tree holes. Uh, there was not enough nutrition in those tree holes for the tadpoles. So the um, fathers would actually sort of sit in the water in these tree holes and let the tadpoles rasp uh, the skin uh, off of their backs. Uh, and they had a very interesting call, which you can go online and hear because it was, it was taped. Um, and the last one, who had been named Tuffy, because uh, he survived so long and was such a tough little guy, uh, died uh, just a week ago. And as far as we know, uh, that species is now extinct. Now that is a story, if that doesn't um, 
you know, tear at your heart. I really don't know what will. Um, but you know what? There's no happy ending here. There no, there is no happy ending to a lot of these stories. So I do think, um, I think Stuart's point's well taken. I don't, I don't want to say that, that that that. But I do think there's also a lot of room in our world uh, for stories that are sad because there's a lot going on that's pretty sad. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Some of these stories are unrelentingly um, unhappy. I mean, I've seen species that are no longer with us. And I take those losses very personally. I think that's a tragedy because uh, they were like this frog. They were fascinating. They were interesting. They're part of our world. I'm not going to be able to show them to my kids and my grandchildren. So I'm not trying to say that I look at the world through rose-colored spectacles. I don't. But on the other hand, it's not true that we're just, you know, having successes on the on the fringe. I think we are having major, major successes in many, many parts of the world. Um, when a species gets put on the US um, endangered species list, it has an extremely good chance of surviving. So it's that kind of a, an impact. You put a species on the list, almost certainly it's going to make it. So there are some, some very significant successes. It's not. You know, it's not, you're not saving one or two children in, the, in Syria, you are, you know, you are finding large-scale solutions. And I think that story is, has been missed. May I ask? You don't have to turn around, sir, <laughs> but you're very, I don't want you to hurt your neck. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to try a piece of that? Yeah, that is a big question. I mean, I, I, you know, was just in Greenland over right, the yeah, summer, yeah. and I wrote a, a story where you know I talk about you know one man's, uh, you know, melting ice sheet is another man's you know mining opportunity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think that you know these are really um, they're really complicated questions, and I I. Uh, I don't, um, once again, you know, this is, um, you know, one of the great things about being a journalist is I, I don't have to pretend to have the answer to that. You know, I don't have the answer to that. Now, how do you get everyone, you know, on board to, f to fight climate change or to, to try to mitigate climate change? Um, once again, if I had the answer to that, I would be a king of the world, you know? <laughs> I mean, obviously, the problem is no one has the answer to that. and. Also, many people feel, correctly or incorrectly, that their interests are not aligned here. Um, and, you know, that was obviously the point of Paris was to try to say, oh, well, all of our interests are really aligned here. Um, that was a more successful than, you know, all previous mm -hmm. uh, COPs had been. I don't want to take it away, anything away from that. Uh, nevertheless, as anyone who participated in it will tell you, uh, you know, it doesn't solve the problem. <laughs> so here we are, you know, um, maybe, uh, maybe we will eventually convince ourselves and, you know, enough that our interests are aligned that we will all sort of get on the same page. Um, but, you know, as I think your question is implying, we as Americans are in a, not in a good position uh, to suggest to other people that all of our interests are aligned because we are such outrageous emitters. Um, so, you know, uh, it's a really, 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 uh, people have described climate change as a wicked, hard problem, and I, I, I'm afraid I think that's true. There's a famous expression that all politics is local, all conservation is local too. Um, it's a matter of engaging people in mostly poor countries, engaging them at the village level. And, um, 
working out solutions that, for them, um, give them a better living and at the same time do less harm to the environment. Um, along with my um, former PhD student, Luke Dollar, we've been working in northwestern Madagascar. There's a beautiful national park there. It has about a dozen species of lemurs. And, and a decade ago, Luke um, realized that every year when people burned their fields, that those fires would burn into the national park, and the national park was shrinking. So he talked to the people in the village. He talked to the women's group in the village. Um, and they said, you know, why, why should we care? I mean, the, the, the national park doesn't do anything for us. To cut a very long story short, we recognized that the one thing that could change that was for them to uh, have a restaurant where they could serve food for people who would come from the town two hours away, see the lemurs, have lunch, and go back again. How do you build a restaurant? You need a cement slab. You can't put a restaurant on a dirt floor. So we had to raise some money for a cement slab. So we would bring a group of people through a project called Earthwatch, where people come and spend a couple of weeks working in the community. First night, we'd take them into the village, we'd circle our vehicles and shine the lights, um, and they would do their traditional dances. And then we'd say, OK, we're going to do our traditional dances. And are you going to go, uh-huh, uh-huh. So, OK, guys, we're all going to do a communal dance to show these Malagazes what we do um, to, as part of our, our culture, right? And you're going to go, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I promise you, you're going to do this. <laughs> So there is a whole community in, in Madagascar who believes that, that we Americans, um, you know, on a Saturday night, go around doing... <laughs> you know, I mean, it's from the, on the village people from, from here. I mean, come on, this is, these are your people. So we raised $6,000. $6, we built the cement slab. They built the restaurant. It's the finest restaurant within... Uh, within 60 miles. It's the only restaurant within 60 miles. <laughs> um, it serves rice and beans and, and french fries and eggs. Um, and as a consequence of that, all the kids in the local village are now going to the school that we built. Um, for a long time, they were wearing Duke University t-shirts. So, you know, Got to get over things like that. Um, they care about that national park. Simple, innovative, clever, solution-oriented. You get, you have to be, you have to live in the community. You have to care about the people. You have to be passionate about them. You have to make sure that their needs and your needs are, are lined up. You can't go in and preach. You can't say you need to care about the environment. They care about feeding their kids. But there's a lot of things like that where you can work out solutions that are appropriate, they're locally appropriate, they're good for the people, and they're good for the environment. A question here. Hi. Um, so we've been talking about solutions, um, you know, as, as a scientist and also as a, a journalist. I, I think maybe that's a goal for both fields or for both of your work. I have maybe an odd question, but I'm wondering if Clearly, I think Betsy thinks it's easy <laughs> to be pessimistic. No, I want to, yeah, so, so can you field that? I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be confused. I don't quite, quite get the question. You're saying, you're saying we just don't see the solution, so it's easy to be pessimistic? Or, yeah, well, I mean, if you look at climate change, you know, uh, uh, you know that's a very 
you know, it's, it's hard to look at what has happened and say, oh, I feel wildly optimistic. On the other hand, you know, there is some progress being made. So you, could, you, can, you can, one could, as an individual, um, you know, decide whether to focus on, you know, certain pr stories of progress or certain stories of, of non-progress, you know, our emissions, you know, continue. Emissions are flat, global emissions are flat basically has that for the last couple of years. So you could say, is that, is that progress or not progress? You know, you, 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 you can decide. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of these um, questions turn out to be, there, there's another element to all of these um, stories, which is, you know, what we don't know, how's that? And in, in climate change, uh, to just use, to use climate change as an example, um, the what we don't know is so is so big, right? What, how much uh, already, how much climate change have we already baked into the system, and what are the impacts of that going to be? Um, but there's just a big question mark over over a lot of a lot of things, and I think um, that's another element that we haven't even really uh, discussed here, which is 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 to what extent we even know we can even really exactly uh, know what how much we have mm. or have not accomplished. How's that? which for a journalist is, 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 is a pretty big question. So some of the answers to some of these imponderables, which are of course caused by human activity, there are you know, some, some intriguing and novel solutions to some of them being posed that are of course the product of the same sort of ingenuity that might have caused some of these problems in the first place. And of course, one of them is this idea of de-extinction. We've been sort of talking about uh, extinction a lot and uh, uh, how gloomy that is, but uh, there are you know, a handful of scientists, uh, distinguished people, who are coming around to the idea that, well, perhaps what we can do is uh, raid the, uh, the, the genetic riches, the troves of our museum collections and uh, you know, bring some of these things back. We can reanimate the passenger pigeon or the dodo or uh, the woolly mammoth. I'm, I'm curious what the two of you think of this sort of thought. I have been unrelentingly unkind about de-extinction. I mean, you were, somebody was, the lady at the back was talking about narcissism. Um, I think Stuart Brand and Ryan Fallon are the most narcissistic people I've ever met. Um, I think that um, this is unbelievable hubris and arrogance. It isn't going to make any difference. Um, it's a way of attracting a lot of attention. And above all, the moral hazard is completely unacceptable. It's like saying, um, you know what, son? You know, you can eat as much fatty food as you want. You don't have to exercise. You can smoke. You can have a really wretched life because if you die at 30, we'll keep your DNA and we'll bring you back. Right? It basically says we can destroy the environment. We don't have to give a damn about, uh, about species, but as long as we keep their DNA, we'll bring them back. And if you think that that's, in some sense, a, an academic debate, Every time that I have testified to House and Senate committees on the Endangered Species Act, they always want to know how close to the brink can you put species? You know, can, you know, can we reduce spotted owls you know, to half a dozen indivi individuals but keep them going alive in captivity and then reintroduce them? Um, and so if we have a de-extinction, we can drive species to extinct, extinction, and as long as their DNA is sitting in a, in a test tube in the American Museum of Natural History, we'll be okay. It's not okay. It's not the way the world wor works. It's, it's really a very, very um, self-centered view of how we should be doing things. Betsy, you ever thought about this? I completely agree with Stuart. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love you. I, um, My yeah. work is done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and you know, one, one other thing that comes to mind, though, is, and is something, because actually Stuart Brand, who's the, 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 the leader in this, um, in talking, talking about this, how's that? Because this, the science, you know, 
really isn't there at this point. I mean, in fact, there's a there's a there's a there's a book by a very eminent paleogeneticist um, that Shapiro called mm. Hadacona Mammoth, which makes you know a, a very compelling case that you know even with the best possible uh, you know scientific advances, you you would never get these species back. You would get you know these weird things that mm -hmm. were sort of half something and half something else. Because first of all, animals learn a lot, right? There's a lot of learning animal kingdom and if you don't have any parents to teach you you know it's very hard to become that animal but anyway um, you know he, he wrote this 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 piece um, recently where he made the point and 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 there were a lot of points in it which I disagreed with but there's there was one point in it that I kind of agreed with which is you know we always pay attention to to extinction you know extinction is this big category you know this sort of binary they exist or they don't exist mm. but but actually, one of the big problems, and I would be actually very interested to hear uh, Stuart's um, views on this, is is that it's not just you know on and off when you you know when the last six individuals die, when Tuffy dies, but but the fact that we're actually, or the fact or the idea, I, I think it's basically a fact uh, that we're emptying out a mm. lot of landscapes. You know, this word yeah. defaunation, uh, it's a terrible word. Unfortunately, we journalists need a better word. But we simply have emptier and emptier worlds. So a species, you know, it's still extant, um, but abundance is just, you know, way, way down of so across so many different groups of, of, of organisms. So you have a question for Stuart? Oh, I, I, oh, yeah, I what's Stuart's we're story? on the same page on All this right. one. This is a this is a major concern of Professor Paul Ehrlich at Stanford. Um, he is very, very concerned about the fact that even if we keep all the species, which is what mm -hmm. I'm concerned about that they will have gone from so much of the planet that, that we will have lost all the things that those species do for us. So, you know, we've lost... In a you know, practical way. In a practical way. Yeah. So we've lost wolves and we've lost mm -hmm. um, uh, mountain lions from eastern United States. So, you know, go, go a few miles north of, um, of Colombia and you're going to be overrun by white-tailed deer and they're carrying ticks and you're getting Lyme disease and all that kind of stuff. Um, and he's right. I mean, we've lost, we've lost a lot of the functional biodiversity of our landscapes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I suppose there's a, 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 a similar concern that the species that remain are, I guess, what's the phrase they call it, what, conservation dependent? Yes. Um, so they're not really wild animals anymore. Uh, the world has become a zoo. Uh, I mean, in a nice way. Um, uh, yeah. And is that necessarily a bad thing? Uh, you know, I, uh, within National Geographic's Big Cats Initiative, we have arguments about this. Um, in South Africa, where I have a, a, a faculty appointment, there's about 800 cheetahs. 400 of them are in Kruger National Park. They're wild, wild. 400 of them are in smaller places where they are quite intensively managed. Mm -hmm. Is that just a big zoo, or is it a managed population? My feeling is that it's good that we have cheetahs in the wild, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of arguments about things like that. Whenever possible, we, you have to do what we try to do at Saving Species, which is to, is to reconnect landscapes. But that's, you know, that's why we do it, and why, that's why it's a difficult issue. Sir, you've been very patient. <coughs> on reconciliation and colony that we can try to have a win-win 
uh, scenario in which people can learn to coexist with the uh, biota. Whereas with Wilson, as, some, as many of you may, may be aware, him, I would have wrote earlier this year called Half Earth, in which he argues that half the planet has to be preserved and uh, mm -hmm. that natural preserve and depopulate black people so that Earth biodiversity can uh, recuperate and uh, resume level comparable to what we knew prior your, to the your question, of sir. No, your, your, I, your I've, question, I've, sir. I've got the. So that's, that's you know, but I need, I need to know what his question is. I, I know what the question is. I bet you do, but yes. I don't. <laughs> so I, I want to ask uh, Dr. Pim's comment on uh, Kurt Rosenzweig's proposal and then on Wilson. First of all, I don't like the term sixth extinction because it's so un unrelentingly gloomy. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's true that if we keep on exterminating species at the rate that we're doing, it will be comparable to the previous five mass extinctions. But it hasn't happened yet, and damn it, I'm going to make sure it doesn't, right? So, so uh, that's why it's called the sixth extinction, is if we continue to do what we're doing, it'll be a big event. I, I think we have the chance to stop that. I have to tell you that Mike Rosenzweig and Ed Wilson are both enormously important people in my life. My, Many people think that Mike was my major professor. He wasn't, but he has a huge amount of influence on my early career. Ed Wilson, uh, because that university to the north of us somewhere in Boston um, <laughs> doesn't properly appreciate him, mm -hmm. uh, the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Institute is based at Duke, and I'm on the science board. Um, so, so I love Ed. He's very impressive. Both Mike and Ed are right. Mike says that we really do need to to try and live with nature as best we can. And New York illustrates that better than any place I've ever lived. Not just the peregrine falcons that disembowel of pigeons, um, but, uh, but Jamaica Bay. I loved it. I mean, I went to Jamaica Bay almost every weekend when I lived here. It's a wonderful place. If you mm -hmm. haven't been out there in the wintertime, mm -hmm. go out there and see thousands of geese flying around with the New York skyline behind. Mm -hmm. Yes, here in New York, we can live in a world with nature. New York is a wonderful example of that. Ed Wilson, on the other hand, wants us to protect half Earth. Can we do that? In some places, we've already succeeded. In other places, it's going to be impossible. Um, but it is an amazing aspiration, and I do believe that we can move in that direction to achieve it. We have another question behind you. What's the Pensy, line out no, of the I movie? Want to take that. No, that's okay. okay. I, I, yeah, yeah. Is no, I, I just no, I've got a one liner. There's, yeah. there's, is, there's a movie where the, 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 the protagonist says, I'm madder than hell and I'm not going to accept it anymore. Uh, that's my solution. <laughs> Me madder than hell and don't let it happen. Betsy. No, I, I, th I, I mean, is, is your question because of, because of, of the, of the you know, sort of danger it poses to us or just emotionally how serious it poses? Well, I think that's a big part of the problem, to be honest, <laughs> that a lot of these, you know, species, um, as far as we know, I don't want to say they don't ramify through the ecosystem, but, you know, when, when um, the last rabs, fringe limb tree frog, you know, died, I, I don't think there are any noticeable or measurable impacts on people living, you know, right in the vicinity. Um, so if we're going to rely on that, you know, when is the species going to go that's going to really bring human society crashing down? We may, we may be, you know, at the end of the sixth extinction um, by the time that happens. And that's a real a question. It's a question. I do want to say it's a question because there's also an argument to be made, you know, that something, Paul Ehrlich has this, makes, uses this, the metaphor of rivets. You have rivets on a plane. You pop a rivet, okay, you're still flying. You pop another rivet, you know, okay, you've got a problem, but you can still fly, you know, to make an emergency landing. Eventually, you crash, you know, and 
we don't know. We don't know if that's an accurate metaphor. Um, we seem to be willing to find out, <laughs> but we don't know. There are three reasons why we care about the environment, uh, and I call them the three E's, and yes, I can spell. One of them is ethics. Um, and um, earlier this year, uh, the Pope came out with a remarkable doc document called Laudato Si. There is a chapter in there about biodiversity. It is an extraordinarily good, competent discussion of the biodiversity crisis. I couldn't have imagined writing a better 3,500 words about why biodiversity matters and what's going on. So there are, there are really strong ethical arguments that we, um, uh, we old people ought to be passing on the planet to you young people in the same condition as we inherited from our parents. The next one is aesthetics. Um, you know, um, who would want to tell their children watching The Wizard of Oz, which I did with my daughters, because I'd never seen it growing up in England. Uh, you know, if you were watching The Wizard of Oz with your kids, you know, and Dorothy says, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, are there going to be wild things out there? Wouldn't it be awful if the answer were no? And then the reality is that it isn't that we sort of, I mean, the image that, that Betsy has suggested of, is, is of sort of taking this poor benighted frog and killing it off. The reality is, by and large, that's not what's happening. We're destroying large pieces of the, of the world's landscape. So we're destroying whole suites of species. And when that happens, you're usually doing massive economic harm. So it matters economically if we destroy the planet. I mean, 10%, 15% of all greenhouse gas emissions come from burning tropical forests. So it's not a species here and a species there, it's a massive loss of, of ecosystem. Yeah, so let me uh, ask you both a question. Um, as, uh, as communicators, as a science activist, as a uh, environmental writer, journalist, we, I've heard a, a, a number of different things when we've talked this evening. I've heard agitation, I've heard, you know, uh, great deal of kind of intellectual acuity, but I have also, in each one of your voices as you've talked about aspects of this, I've heard something that you, we don't normally talk about when we're talking about science communication, which I heard love. In you I heard love for a frog. No, seriously. It came out in your voice, it started to crack. When I see you, sir, uh, get passionate about um, the irritation that you feel with those of us who just want to point out the problems with this and not the solutions to save the things that you clearly love. So what I wonder is, in this kind of public communication about science, does this love help or hinder your work? I've never doubted for a minute um, that for me it is a matter of um, of love, of, of commitment of my Christian beliefs um, that we ought, to, we ought to care about the planet. That doesn't tell me how I do my science, it just tells me what's important about my science. Um, so um, I became a conservation biologist in the late 1970s working in Hawaii, um, watching species go extinct, having the kind of experiences that Betsy was just talking about. And that for me was a defining moment. Uh, I thought, you know, I'm, I've got a career as a scientist, I'm beginning to do good science, I'm beginning to publish in, you know, science and nature. And none of that will make any difference if I let the world go to hell. So for me, it's a very um, a, a, a emotional, um, very spiritual issue. Um, and I want my science to be done in a way that um, does something about it. Betsy? Well, I, I mean, I think that, you know, as, as a journalist, I mean, I guess in, it's a different way of saying sort of what I was trying to convey before, which is that, you know, the world is really an amazing place and a fascinating place. And I think that everybody feels this, you know, if, if 
e even you know people who are out there you know doing things that we would might say are destructive and reprehensible if you if you actually you know there are very few people are there are some but very few people who are not really actually interested if you um, introduce them or, 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 or talk to them about you know the, the natural world and so I, I do think you know Ed, Ed Wilson's phrase biophilia it does it does lurk there uh, e everywhere um, and I think that that is one of the you know great underlying I hope I, I do try to um, appeal to that I suppose in, in readers too and that's what anim animates stories that's what can make a story you know makes the story interesting to people, right? Animals don't have voices. This is one of the terrible um, dilemmas for, for journalists. You can't, you can't interview them, they're terrible interview, you know? Um, and so you, you, know, you always end up speaking sort of for them or the scientists have to speak for them. Um, but I think that, that that some connection, drawing some connection between, between people and these an species, not necessarily animals, also plants that cannot speak for themselves, um, that's sort of our job. Um, and the fact that they tend to be, um, that there is this deep, profound, evolutionarily, you know, ingrained, perhaps, connection uh, works, works uh, in, in, in our favor. And, and I think, you know, does, is, is the basis of all of, of, all of our, uh, uh, of all of our caring, really. And, you know, even be long before that point at which, you know, the last rivet pop, um, you know, I do think, I do think people care, the, the question is, you know, w in the in the constellation of caring, you know, where where does this come in? That that is the question, and it's a big question. <laughs> and it is a big question, with which we will have to live, going forward, because we have now reached the end of our time here. <laughs> and I just want to say we began this evening in th with a contemplation of a public silence, and the two of you, with great grace and compassion, and intelligence, have filled it, mm -hmm. and I thank you for that. So please join me. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much.